that. We're going to continue today, part two of our series, talking about mental health. Mental health. Now, this one is controversial and challenging to talk about for a lot of the same reasons. For shame. There's shame. There's judgment. That's if I if I really open up and talk about my my mental illness or my struggles or my issue with anxiety or panic attacks or or that I have you know my my spouse or someone I love that's schizophrenic or bipolar. There's just like man. There's there's a lot of confusion to not only just a, a, about it but also what God says about it. There's a lot of different perspectives. So I kind of want to level the playing field a little bit and let's just get honest about what is currently and has always been an epidemic mental illness but now after covid is even worse the mental state of our country and our world so today if you have or know someone that has mental illness um, a family member or maybe a really close friend will you raise your hand raise your hand anyone anyone come on come on come on just like I, a lot can you just leave it up for a moment just look around look at how close this is for every single one of us. Thank you. Go ahead and put your hands down. That's, uh, and myself included, I have two brothers that suffer from mental illness. One brother who it's like drug-induced mental illness, and another brother who has passed away, it was just an emotional um, onslaught that he could not do. Circumstances could not manage and process in a way that led to his mental illness. But I even... Even like the drug-induced, we say like drug-induced mental illness, it really was not drug-induced. It was actually a mental health issue that was not handled in an appropriate way and was medicated and then created even more illness because we didn't manage our mental health. And so, so today what I want to do, I, I want to give clarity to this mental health, to mental health. What, is, what does God say? What does the Word of God say about mental health, which there is a bunch, there's a lot that God says about this, and then we're going to apply God's word to our personal mental health, okay? So let me start off. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, very important and foundational to our understanding of what God says about mental health is this concept of our creation. How did God create humans? And I'll tell you why this is very important. It says this in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. So God does not want you just holy in part of your life. Like there's only a certain part of you that can ever be holy and good and righteous. The rest of you just need to deny that stuff, but there's just this part of you. God, no, God says, I want all of you, your total being in every way to be holy and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. So here we see these three distinct components of our created being, our nature. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Just as God is triune, he created mankind triune. We all have a body, physical parts, and we all know that. We can see that. There's a physical part of our being. But then there's this soul part. That is actually your emotional, your mental, your thought life. Now, those, both of those things God created for his glory and for your good. We just read last week about your bodies, right? God says, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is an act of worship. So that body is for his glory. It's, it, it's part of your creative being. And then your soul, this mental, emotional thing. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Let all that is within me praise his holy name. So we're to honor God and bless God. And God actually wants every part of our life, every part of our life to be holy to him. And then there's this spirit part, which is actually the, the deepest part of the inner man, the inner woman, the inner part. It is the deepest part of who you are, your identity. It's who you are. It's how we commune and connect with God, who is spirit, with our spirit. Now, there is some thoughts that are just not good theology. It's just not good. It's not, it's not good. We think that just the spirit part of you is the good part. The rest of the stuff just needs to be denied, just neglected, just forget it. It's evil. Your body's evil. Your soul's evil. Your emotions are evil. Your thoughts, it's all just falling. Just, just be spirit. Just feed the spirit. Live with your head in the clouds. and Just try to, try to be in the spirit and the rest of the stuff. No. 
That's not biblical at all. Now, please walk in the spirit, but that does not mean that you should not honor God with your body and with your soul. Okay, you're created with all three of these things and God desires them to be holy. So how do we do that? Your body, your soul and your spirit. Romans chapter seven, verse 15 and 18. Paul actually is writing to the to the church at Rome and he himself is writing a very vulnerable letter. Here's what he says. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. Okay, I want to point out here that Paul is writing in the first pre- in the first person present tense, meaning as he's writing this, he is struggling with this. So he's not telling the Roman church about something that he has been through. He's writing in present tense saying, "I for what I want to do, I don't do." But what I hate to do, I do. This is what's going on in my life right now. I know that nothing good lives in my simple nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. Anyone can sympathize with that struggle, okay? I got the desire, but then, man, there's just something else is inside of me that overtakes me. Uh, This is the battle that every one of us are in. Every one of us. I remember when I was a little kid, my, my parents used to take me to to Chuck E. Cheese. My mom, my family, we go to Chuck E. Cheese, and that place is evil, okay? That place is, <laughs> it is just the worst pizza in the world, cardboard tasting, but they would get me with the games, right? The games, what it's all about. Now it's maybe, what, John's Incredible now is what they, okay, but there was this game called Whack-A-Mole that is of the devil, okay? <laughs> that game is not good, like, because I would, I remember just trying to hit it so hard, like, and no matter how hard I hit it, it would just keep coming back. And I mean, just, just going, and, I, and, and it just not, it just wouldn't. I mean, you know, life is like whack-a-mole. No matter how hard I try, no matter how, I think I got that thing under control. I think that emotion I finally overcome. I think that habit I finally overcome. All my relationships in a good place. And then all of a sudden, it just pops back up, but in a different place. Life is like whack-a-mole, okay? And largely, largely how we deal with um, our emotional whack-a-moles will determine your mental health. So what I want to do is I, I put in your handout a little survey. I want, what I want you to do is whatever you're struggling with that keeps popping up in your life, like the whack-a-mole stuff, I want you to identify what those are in the handout I gave you. It'll be online as well. Like, what are the things that keep popping up? Is it stress? Do fears keep popping up? Overwork? Attractions? Addictions? Regrets? Diets? Like yo-yo diet? Worry? Bad habits? Anger? Does that keep popping up in your life? How about dishonesty? How about the need to control or finances? You can't pay your bills. Does that keep popping up? Relationships? Painful memories keep popping up. Perfectionism? Resentment? Compulsive thoughts? Here, I just want you to identify some things and circle. Like, those things keep popping up. Because how you handle those circumstances, feelings, and emotions will determine if you go from mental health to mental illness. Okay? And every one of us, every one of us has a mental capacity that needs to be managed. And and I think one of the biggest problems with this topic is the stigma associated with it. Like if you get sick with the cold or the flu, it's just, it's different it, like, we get ill, and if we have mental illness, it's just, it's different. Like, any other part of your body gets sick, you get sympathy from people. But if your mind gets sick, you get shame from people. And it just shouldn't be that way. So here, church, I want to make this statement. We need to remove the stigma. That's what we need to do, remove the stigma. And there's a slide that should be coming up. Remove the stigma around mental illness and make mental health a common conversation. Like, church, we got to just make this comfortable. Like, the stigma needs to be removed in Jesus' name. We have to understand that there really isn't much difference between physical illness and mental illness. Please hear me when I say this. It's not a sin to be sick. It's not a sin if you catch a flu or COVID. It ain't a sin if your mind gets sick. And some of us think that way. And this is from the very beginning. Remember, we studied the book of John where they're like, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents? Everyone wants to blame sin. No, it's not a sin to be sick. And, and here's another thing I want you to write down. Your illness 
is not your identity. Your illness is not your identity. Your chemistry is not your character. It doesn't define you. You may struggle with mental illness, but it is not your identity. If you are a follower of Christ, your identity is in Christ. Your primary identity is not your illness. Your primary identity is in Jesus. But, but we also have to be careful with this. We've got to be careful of putting on in church and acting like everything is okay when really it's not. Like in faith, in faith, we do understand it's okay. Like I know most of you, like most of you believe and most of you know and you trust God. So there's a part of you kind of like Paul that's like, yeah, I, I believe and I want to. But there's this other part of you that doesn't. And, and so we'll, do, we'll say things like, oh, yeah, I already prayed about it. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I, submitted it, I submitted it to God. And it's like, it's so fresh. There's no way your mind is caught up with your faith. And that's just phony stuff that's going to get you in trouble. Let me, let, me, let me say this. Listen, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay. And if you don't accept that from yourself, but also from God and from us, you cannot get any help. Every one of us has a few screws loose. Come on, somebody. I got some screws. You got some screws loose. Every one of us. Ain't nobody tight everywhere, okay? We want to create an environment in God's house where it's somewhat normalized to express what's going on on the inside of us. Instead of having to fear judgment and shame and criticism, we want to create that environment. So if you don't think it's okay to not be okay, you know what'll happen? You'll hide it. And that's where all the problems manifest, is when you hide it instead of bring it to the light. Instead of dealing with it in an honest and vulnerable way, we act like it's not there, and that's where it grows in the darkness. And because we're not managing our health, our mind becomes ill. In a given year, if you want to see some stats, as I was studying this, Nearly one in five, that's 20% of U.S. adults, experience some form of mental illness. That's 20%. These are like, obviously, every year, it's different. You may have a bad year, then you have a good year. But 20% of people, humans, we're going to suffer from it. Uh, one in 20 has a serious mental illness, and serious by meaning like bipolar, schizophrenia. Um, that's like a, a serious mental illness. One in five, 6.7, has a diagnosable substance abuse Disorder. So I want to ask the question, like, what's going on with our humanity? What, what's happening here? Why, why are we having so many struggles with mental illness and mental health that, that seems to be increasing? How do we find ourselves in this situation? Now, I do want to say, anyone that's here that's, that's struggling with mental illness, I hope that today you find hope, you find healing, and and that you understand that there is hope in Christ and that there is a community of people here that are not going to judge you, that are not going to make you feel like an outcast, but that you can walk through a vulnerable and honest um, process here at Discovery. In my, in my research, I discover, though, that this is large, and I don't want me to diminish, diminish anyone's experience, but on a large scale, mental illness largely has to do with lifestyle issues. Again, I do not diminish your experience, and it's not always the case, but on a macro scale, this is a lifestyle issue. Here's what Stephen Elardi, he wrote the book called The Depression Cure. Um, he said, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. Guys, that's all of us. Living on fast food and indoor all the time at a computer desk or on our phone or way too much schedule, over scheduled. It is literally, he goes on to say in his book, it's literally reforming our brain. We are reprogramming our, vein, our brain, our humanity, the way that our brains are wired are changing because of our lifestyle. And then you add to that a few things. Let me just give you a few things I think so. Is this cell phone and social media. Like it's out of control right now. We're just consumed by it to where now there's a real thing called phantom notification. Have you ever get a phantom notification? You know what that is. It's where like you feel your thigh buzzing and it ain't buzzing. <laughs> Did I get a notification? And nothing. It's nothing. Nothing. Or you put your phone down somewhere in the house and you're like, do I hear a buzz? I heard a ring. Where's my? And you got to go like, no, I heard it. I heard it. No. You got your butt vibrating and stuff. And it's like, that's not, that's something else. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. 
You go see your doctor for that one. No. So we're live on this one too. But we're raising, we're raising our kids on social media and it's, and it's reprogramming their brain, you guys. We weren't wired. We were, the human race was not wired. We're not created by God to be so consumed by, by media. And, and we're, not, we're not experiencing life anymore. We're not experiencing outdoors. The dirt and grass out there. You know, studies, the research shows that cultures who spend more time in the sun and in the dirt have dramatically less mental illness. Because we're just not, we're just weren't made for this kind of lifestyle. How about this one? Here's another added, a, a lack of identity. Where people just don't know who they are or what they're living for. They just, there's so much confusion around identity. That's why here at Discovery, we constantly preach and teach, discover your purpose, discover who you are, discover and activate that. How about this? An Ill, inability to process pain is why we have this epidemic that we're in right now. People's way to process pain is just medicate it, drink it, or TV, watch it away. Binge eat, binge drink, binge watch, just adding to the pain, okay? Now, I will say this, because this is another, like, divided issues, especially among those who are super spiritual, some medication is helpful to the healing process of mental illness, okay? We just, this is part of the stigma with men mental illness. People think that they know better than physicians and know your body better and know your experience better, and so they judge you for taking some sort of medication for it. In church, that's got to stop. That's just got to stop. We need to, we need to stop judging people for medicating an illness. I will say this, though. On the other side of that coin, if you're thinking about taking medication, do your research. Okay, do the research because some medication is not helpful to the chemical. Like there's some medication that actually some of your chemicals are not being produced and some chemicals need to be blocked. Some medication will help that and is proven to help your body regulate chemically. Other medications do not. It's just an, a Band-Aid. It's just an immediate quick fix. So you just need to do some research as to what, where you're at in your body, maybe even talk to a few different physicians, because there are some physicians that are medication happy, and they just quickly, quickly try to prescribe something as that. I will say this, though. If you are going to take medication, listen, all treatment of mental illness, illness should combine therapy, okay? Another stigma. Stop it. I get therapy. Routinely, I get therapy myself and with my wife, and I encourage people to get it. And if you need to go, oh, pastor's life better must be pretty messed up. No more than yours. Shut your mouth. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, it's preventative maintenance, though. Like, I deal with a lot. I hear a lot. I see a lot. And so I don't want to get to the end of the, I don't want to have a, a mental breakdown, a spiritual breakdown, a breakdown in my marriage. I want to be able to have routine maintenance where I'm talking about some of the heavy things that I'm processing in my life, in my family and my ministry, my leadership, and my stage of life and the loss of life that I have, all that, I just, I, it's healthy. It's biblical. Like it's actually what we're supposed to do in the body of Christ, but there's just sometimes here, and this is why, here's another reason why, and this is connected to it, why we're in this crisis that we're in a mental illness, because we have a whole bunch of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Instead of you going to someone with wisdom experience, you're going to your friends. And, and can I tell you, I would not be here today if I listened to all my knucklehead friends. Those guys didn't know what they were doing. There's no like elder to younger mentorship or someone with wisdom and experience passing that on to this next generation. We got this peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And then here, how about this? We got this narcissistic culture that we're living in. It's just all about me. It's the selfie generation. It's just more megapixels, front-facing cameras, flash on the front now, and all that stuff. It's all because we're so narcissistic in our culture. Okay, these are just some reasons why this is an epidemic, why it's so close to every one of us. So close. Let me give you a few books, though. If this is, if this is something you want to grow in and you want to study for yourself, you may want to take a picture or write these down. This is some of the study that I've done. Um, Dr. Caroline Leaf is amazing, and she wrote a lot of resources. One of her um, most recent one is Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, Five Simple Scientific Proven Steps to Reduce Anxiety, Stress, and Toxic Thinking. Okay, this is a great book, Christian author, great stuff. And then Craig Rochelle wrote Winning the War in Your Mind. Some great resources if you want to write that down. Before I further go into God's Word, though, I do want to talk briefly about what some people do um, in situations like this. And they don't know what to do with their mental health situation. And they consider ending their life. So I just, I've been praying for you all week 
and anyone that's, that's hearing this today, and this is becoming more of an option that people are taking. It's been an increase of suicide, 35% since COVID, since 2020. Suicide is twice the murder rate. It is the number one killer of kids aged 15 to 24. So can I just give you some hope here? Suicide, please listen. Suicide is a permanent, irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. I understand it feels overwhelming for anyone that's struggling and thinking some thoughts about ending it all. I know the feelings are very real, and they're like a wave that crashed in. But please hear me. That wave is going to recede again. Okay? You don't, it's, a, it's a temporary solution. Okay? Let me say it like this, too. You don't have to die to end your pain. You don't. It, it's, it, it, we validate and acknowledge the reality of your pain, but that wave is going to recede again. And a lot of times, we're just we're taking counseling from ourselves instead of from others and opening up. If you know anyone that's thinking about taking their life, or you're here, maybe you're thinking about that, let me give you this final resource, um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you know anyone, this is a great resource for them. If you're here today, Please write this number down, 1-800-273-TALK, okay? They'll talk you out of what really is a wrong solution to a very real problem. Amen? Okay, okay, let me, let, let me jump into the Word of God now, and let's discover what He says about it and how we can apply it to our life. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Don't be conformed, we know this, to the pattern of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. And here's how He does it. He does it by changing the way you think. He does it by changing that soul part of you, your mental, your emotional, your mind. So we need to learn how to manage our minds. How do we do that? What does God's word say about mental health and managing our mind? Why should we do that? Here's a few reasons. Number one, because my thoughts control my life. Well, God, God controls my life. No, God is not a ventriloquist, okay? Your thoughts are going to control your life. My thoughts control my life. Every single action always begins with a thought. If you don't think it, you're not going to do it. That's the same for good and bad, all good and bad things. It first starts as a thought. Here's a quote from Dr. Caroline Leaf in her research. It shows that 75 to 98% of all mental, physical, and behavioral illness is caused by our thought life. It's all, listen, it's my, my thoughts control my life. This is how the Bible says it. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. People will sometimes say, well, I was just thinking it. I wasn't going to do it. You don't know how important your thoughts are, how powerful your thoughts are. Some of you believe that you're, you still believe thoughts that were given to you and spoken over you. So, someone said you're worthless, you're an idiot, that you're ugly, that you're uncoordinated, that you're stupid. That, and you still today, years later, are, you, those thoughts are shaping your life. Listen, your feelings don't shape your life, your thoughts shape your life. So it's, it's what, how you are thinking about what you're feeling that is shaping your life, not the feelings themselves. See, the life we have is a reflection of the thoughts we think. What we think determine who we become. See, a lot of you were taught things as a kid that just weren't true. Things that were spoken over you. Years later, you're still acting on false information. And listen to me, church. We need to be transformed by the renewing, by changing the way we think. Number two, why do you got to manage your mind? Because my mind is the battleground for sin. This is where the enemy is attacking your life. And it's where I win or lose the battle. In fact, all temptation starts in the mind. We think temptation is out there. It's out there. It's something else. It's that thing. Oh, I'm tempted by that thing. I'm tempted. No, that's not where tempted. You wouldn't be tempted, tempted at all if there wasn't a corresponding desire for that thing. Temptation begins inside. And even when we talk about certain sins like pride and lust and anger and, and all these things, resentment and hatred and worry, where all those things start, they're in your mind. So if I can learn how to manage my mind, I can learn then to manage my life. This is where the battleground is. Romans chapter 7, 22, 23. Paul says, I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned. I love that. He's like, he's like there's a part of me that really wants to really do the right thing. And that's what every one of us would say. Most of you in here is like, my new name, like there's a part of me that loves God and wants to do his will and wants to do all those things. I want to serve. I want to give. I want to do groups. I want to be a good person. 
That's all of most of us in here, at least, all right? But there's something else deep within me. Look what he says. That's at war with my mind. That's where the battlefield is. There's something else that's contradicting, that's at war with my mind. And it actually wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin within me, he says. Oh, man, he just says, in my mind, I want to be God's servant. But instead, I find myself still enslaved to sin. And what is he saying here? He's saying there's a battle in your mind. That's where this is happening. There is a battle. And see, if you're not thinking about what you're thinking about, you're going to lose the battle. All right? If you're not managing your mind and thinking about your mental health, which God wants to be holy and blameless, that you are overlooking, you are eventually going to become mentally ill. So I need to manage my mind because my thoughts control my life because my mind is the battleground for sin and temptation. And then thirdly, because managing your mind is actually the key to life and peace. Now, this is not some positive thinking mumbo jumbo I'm giving you, okay? This is the Bible. This is the word of God. When you learn how to apply these truths, the truths of God's word to your life, you will be filled with his life and his peace. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 6. That's, this point is just right out of the Bible. If your sinful nature, look what he says, controls your mind. That means if you're constantly thinking about sinful things to please your flesh and sinful nature, there's going to be darkness, depression, panic, death, destruction. That's what's going to happen. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, see where it's all, so, so whether it's, it's what you're thinking about, it's what you're meditating on, there is life and peace. That's the power of your mind. If you, if you manage your mind. See, an unmanaged mind leads to tension. But a managed mind leads to tranquility. An unmanaged mind leads to pressure and, and pain. But a managed mind leads to peace. So let's apply this to our lives, our mental health. Maybe for a lot of us in here, we need to take our mental health more seriously. We need to actually manage our mental health in a way that honors God that we would bring to him our soul, our mind, our thoughts, our emotions in a way that honors him in worship. There's three day, daily choices that I want to show you in the word of God daily that you need to make on a daily basis for your mental health. A lot of people don't realize that you can control your thoughts. Amen. Some people say, well, my thoughts are uncontrollable. I got uncontrollable thoughts. No, you just think they're uncontrollable, but you can control your thoughts. In fact, Nobody else can control your thoughts. Do you know that Satan can't control your thoughts? He can influence your thoughts. He can tempt you and stuff, but he can't control your thoughts. No one can. No other person can control. Oh, they made me mad. They didn't make you mad. They gave you an opportunity to choose madness. Okay? So no one can. Listen, God won't even control your thoughts. That's why it is futile to pray, oh, God, like, change my thoughts from this fear or worry or anxiety. God goes, you change it. Those are yours. You, that's your thoughts. So God is not going to change your thoughts. He doesn't overstep that line. So if I want to have a healthy mind, if I want to break free from bad patterns that I've developed that are affecting my mental health, maybe these whack-a-mole things keep coming up and you're like not, you're not responding in a healthy way that is healthy for your, your soul. What are the choices that you're missing here? There's three choices. Let me, I'm going to tell you them, and then I'm going to teach them. you got to feed, free, and focus. you got to feed, free, and focus. If I want a healthy mind, number one, I must feed my mind with the truth. I need to feed. i got to feed it truth. We all know the importance of nutrition, right? you got good food, good calories, healthy food, and healthy calories going to produce good energy, a clear mind. But we also know bad calories, greasy food, Bad food is going to produce an unhealthy body, an unhealthy mind, lacks clarity. It's the same in your soul. Here's what Proverbs 15, 14 says. Look at this. A wise person is hungry for what? Truth. Truth while the fool feeds on social media. <laughs> or daytime television. I don't know. Put in your trash. Put in your trash, okay? That's what fools feed on. We need to feed our mind with the truth of God's word. Not consume all bad calories, greasy junk. You're living and consuming in your mind things that are destroying your mental health. 
Okay, if you want to have a healthy mind, mental health, clarity, if you want to bring your soul blameless and holy before God, you need to feed your mind truth, not trash. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said this, people need more than bread for their life. They must feed from every word of God. Okay, I'm just not going to survive on, the, on my body feeding. I need to make sure that I'm feeding my soul the right thing as well. Okay, I'm going to feed my soul healthy truth, not the garbage of the world. John chapter 8, 32, Jesus says, a lot of us kind of know this verse. Even if you don't go to church, you probably know a variation of this verse. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free or set you free. How many of you know that verse? You've heard that verse. Yeah, that's what sets us free. Feed your mind with truth. Truth is going to set you free. But we don't understand that this verse actually begins with a very powerful word. It's a conditional statement, then. 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 There we go. <laughs> then. So, so this is a conditional statement. The truth won't set you free unless something happens. That's what he's saying. So we like to say, oh, they know the truth, and the truth will set you free. No, nope, there's actually a condition that Jesus was speaking. So let's read this verse in context, and let's see how the truth actually sets you free. In John chapter 8, verse 31, let's back up one verse and see what Jesus said. Jesus said to the Jews that believed in him, if you continue to obey my teaching, you are truly my followers, and then you will know the truth. And that truth that you obey will set you free. So, so it's not the truth you believe, it's the truth you obey. Oh, come on now. Over here didn't hear it or something. Okay, they heard it over here. Come on. It's, it's that truth. Some of us with, oh, if you know the truth, the truth sets you free. No, no, no. It's not. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you obey my teaching, then that truth is going to set you free. It ain't a knowledge, it's an obedience. So I got to feed my mind with the truth and apply his truth to my life. See, some believers, they follow their feeling when they should be following their faith. Okay, so, so here's, if these are just daily choices, daily choices you got to make for your mental health. First one is I got to feed my mind with the truth. Number two, I must free my mind from toxic thoughts. Now, every one of us has toxic thoughts because we live in a toxic world. They're constantly being bombarded with us. Just because you think the thought does not mean you own the thought. Okay, there's a, in fact, most of your, the thoughts that you're thinking, they need to be filtered. You guys are unfiltering your, your, your thoughts need to be liberated. Our, my thoughts included need to be delivered, need to be set free and released because we can become a prisoner to our own thoughts. You're a prisoner to what you're thinking about yourself. You're a prisoner to what you are thinking about life and your future and your situation and about them and, and what other people told you. We can become a prisoner to those things. Romans 8 and 5 says those who are dominated by their simple nature, they think about those things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Here's what he's saying. What comes into your mind actually comes out in your life. So we got to think about what we're thinking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says it like this. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with, notice the language. This is warfare language. This is battle language. I got to fight, man. There's a, there's a spiritual battle that I need to wage. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And this is what he says. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive what thought? Every thought. Not just some thoughts, not just partial. No, no, no. He says, as children of God, here's your battle. You got to take captive every single thought and bring it into the obedience of Christ. I got an illustration for you to help you guys understand how to do this and when we're not doing this what's actually happening because we got to free our mind from the toxic thoughts that are consuming us when a when a thought comes into your mind listen when it's unfiltered it's unseasoned it's uncooked it's just raw it's a raw thought 
and you just sit on it like it's a raw piece of chicken. How many of you want to take a bite of this raw piece of chicken right here? Does that look good? This is this camera right here. There you go. Now you can see it. Now you can see it. There you go. Okay. Here's what I want you to see. When you have a thought, it comes, it comes at you raw. And when you let it sit in your life and in your mind, it is poisoning you. You're, you're giving yourself salmonella. Okay? You're just, you're, you're, you're contaminating your life with a toxic thought. And not only that, because we, we're, now, we're not seasoning it, we're not cooking it, we're not baking it, we're not doing nothing but sitting on that toxic. Now when I share that thought and that offense and that hurt, and you go, can you believe? And you're sharing your salmonella to everyone you're talking to. Like, can you believe they? And this is what they did. And my boss, and my mom, and my brother, and my sister, and my, and my. And you're just poisoning everybody. Toxin, 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 toxin. Salmonella, salmonella. You're just spreading your disease. There's a difference between being raw and being real. Okay? Raw, sure, it's authentic, but you're poisonous. You're toxic. And some of you, some of you take pride in your rawness, and you're toxic. You are, you are, you are holding on to unprocessed. Un See, you, ha you have not processed that thought through the word of God, through your faith. You haven't seasoned that thing, cooked. Because there's when I when I process it and I season it through, I take it captive and I and I see God's word and I marinate it with God's word and I cook it. When I process that thought and I share it with you, it's not poisonous, it's nutritious. This this thought is consumable now. I'm sharing my thoughts through the filter of my faith and the word of God that can actually add value to your life. Now, it's not going to poison you. It's an experience that God gave me that is a blessing to you. Let me share what God did. Let me show you what God did in this situation. I'm here. Let me show you what happened when this person hurt me and what God did through that. And he reconciled that. Let me show. I, I messed up and I made a mistake. But can I share with you what God did and how he redeemed and how he revealed and how he reconciled? That's a consumable thought. That's why you have to take every thought captive. When you do not take every, if you are not managing your mind, you're losing the war. And you're poisoning yourself. You're sitting on salmonella. Okay? And I hope this, I hope this illustration stays with you forever. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Okay, how do you take your thoughts captive? Let me give you a quick three steps. How do you do that then? Okay, because it's like, man, every thought? Dang, am I just going to be like in a thought blaze all day? Okay, because here's the thing. As you practice these principles, as you feed, as you free, as you focus, as you feed, as you free, as you focus, and I'm going to show you how, as you do that, it will become second nature to you. It will be like your internal operating system that you'll just be capturing stuff and capturing stuff in your soul and in your, in your spirit. You won't even have to think about it, but you're going to have to think about it at first until it becomes a discipline. How do you do it? Three steps, really quickly. Pay attention to your inner monologue. Okay, pay attention to what you are telling yourself. What you are saying about yourself, what you're saying about them, how you are talking inside of yourself. And you gotta, you got to compare that thought. But what do you compare it to? Compare it to the word of God. Does it align? Does my thought, is it true? Does it, is, is this honoring? Is it helpful? Is it, is it inspiring? Is it, is, is, it, uh, is it aligning with the word of God here? And then after you do that, you, pro, you kind of got to project now. And go ahead, go ahead. You got to proclaim the truth over your life. You got to proclaim God's word. Stop proclaiming your thoughts over your life and proclaim God's truth over your life. Okay, lastly, number three, number three, I got to focus. What do we focus on? I got to focus my mind on the right things. Focus my mind on the right things. For your mental health, we got to focus on the right things. Why? Because your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life is always moving in the direction of your, so the question becomes, what direction do you want to go in? Where are you going? And where do you want your life to go? Because that's where your thoughts need to be. So the word of God tells us there's a few directions that your thoughts should be. Because God has a direction for your life. Amen? God has a direction. So he says, hey, I got, I got a few thoughts that you need to, to get to the right direction, to get to the right destiny I have for you. Here's a few thoughts that you need for your mental health. You got to focus on the right things. Here are the right things. Number one, God says, you got to think about Jesus. You know that cliche, you become whatever you think about the most? Yeah? 
Well, if you think about Jesus the most, guess what? You're going to become more like Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.8 tells us, keep your mind on Jesus Christ. So I'm going I'm to think, I'm going to focus, I'm going to fix my mind upon him. Number two, I got to think about others. Think about others. Yeah, you can go there. Go ahead and skip there. Ride with me, bro. Think about others. Don't just think about yourself. Can, you know how countercultural this is? To not, to, to not just like think about yourself and your own needs and your own interests. Look, if you want to stay healthy mentally, let me say it the other way. If you, if you want bad mental health, try to just make your own life about you. All about you, your happiness, your, that is a sure way to be miserable. God says if you want to be mentally healthy, then you should think about others. Okay, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they're doing. So you got to think about others. Don't just think about your own affairs. Be interested in their lives. Serve other people. Help other people. Get on a team. Here at Discovery, we want you on a team. Discovering your purpose and getting on a team somewhere serving. Not because like, oh, we need some more workers around here. No. We want you because we know that it is for your health, for your benefit, that you think about others, serve others, and stop making your life all about your life. <laughs> your life isn't about you. It's not. It's about him. And Jesus says, hey, if you want to, you got to think about Jesus, think about others. And then number three, we got to think about eternity. This is the best decision, the best decision of your life, man, the biggest difference to your mental state. Think about eternity. There's more to this life than just now. The problems today are not, they're short-lived, they're temporary. It's short-term thinking when we get so caught up. We only think about what's happening right now. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 2 says this, let heaven fill your thoughts. Let's just be honest. Let's be honest. I know I gave you the last feeling. Come on. Stick with me for a moment. Let's be honest. What are filling your thoughts? What is consuming your thoughts? Is it really heaven? Is it eternity? Because this life on earth is just a small piece of it. If we're honest, we think more about the problems of this life, the relationships of this life, the concerns and cares of the drama and gossip of this life. God says if you want to be healthy mentally in your soul, then, then you got to let heaven, my eternal life, like I'm going to let heaven, eternity, fill my thoughts. Don't just think only about things down here on earth, he says. Now listen, I believe God can do anything. How I many you believe that? God can heal miraculously and immediately anything. He can heal all mental illness immediately. Like, and that's God, and God has done that, and I've seen him do it. But I will say this, listen to me please, child of God, more often than not, I've seen God take people on a mental health journey. Because even if God does it supernaturally and miraculously in a moment, it does not absolve you of managing your mental health. You will end up in the same place if you don't develop the skills and the worship, the stewardship of your mind, your emotions, the whack-a-moles that come up. Stewarding that properly so that you can present your whole being, mind, body, and spirit blameless before God. That takes, that takes a management, stewardship. So God can... That doesn't absolve you. Every one of us needs to be managing our mental health. Why? Because God wants it presented to him blameless. He created it. Amen? Can I pray for you? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Some of you